Well, the, the diet heart hypothesis suggests that it's satura particularly saturated fat in the diet that raises the cholesterol. But we're realizing it's much more complex than that and that it's quite true that there are saturated fats that do raise total cholesterol, but there are the saturated fats which are norm which are without effect and that there are other fats which may in fact lower the cholesterol concentration. But it's not something that concerns me because what concerns me is what's happening to the other variables which are really important. So remember I said the good and bad cholesterol, and I'm going to use this analogy which, which is facetious but it's interesting. So cholesterol is cholesterol. It is a, it's a chemical which is crucial for health. You cannot live without chem with cholesterol. Cholesterol makes up a large proportion of your brain is made up of cholesterol. And the idea that some of it's good and some of it's bad is based on the th this findings in the Framingham study that the HDL cholesterol is, is linked to reduced risk and that LDL is linked to increased risk. So what happens is the HDL cholesterol is likely to take cholesterol away from the plaque where the LDL cholesterol is likely to take cholesterol to the plaque. And so someone said it's like an ambulance and you have a good ambulance and a bad ambulance. So the ambulance that's going out to pick up the patient who's had a heart attack, that's a, that's a bad ambulance. But the good ambulance is the one that brings it back to the hospital. I mean, that's how illogical it is. It's cholesterol is cholesterol. And the point is, as I'll explain, it's not cholesterol which causes heart disease, it's lipoproteins. Because cholesterol is not water soluble, it's a fat, and it has to be transported in the body in lipoproteins. And that means it's a covering of proteins. And those proteins, the type of lipoprotein that you have, determines your risk of heart disease. The cholesterol is in one particular, or in certain number of the lipoproteins, are full of cholesterol. But it's the lipoprotein that determines your risk of heart disease, not cholesterol. And what happened in the 1960s, when the theory, the heart disease theory came along, they discovered it's very easy to measure cholesterol, but it's very difficult to measure lipoprotein. So they said, well, it's simpl let's simplify. Let's not confuse the issue. We won't go the lipoprotein route because that's too complex. We don't want to confuse the public and we don't want to make it difficult to measure. We'll go the cholesterol route because it's easy to measure. So we'll tell people it's cholesterol that's causing heart disease because that's easy to measure. And then we just give you a number five. If your value is below five, you're healthy. If it's above five, you're unhealthy. And that's how they simplified it. And it was wrong. The model was wrong. It's lipoproteins, as I'll show, that you can have a cholesterol of 5 and it be at their store, and you can have a cholesterol of 15 and be absolutely healthy. It depends how the cholesterol is contained in the lipoproteins. That's what the key is, and the public are not really informed about that. So then I'm just going to show you another paper which was published um, about two or three years ago, which is not industry-funded. This study is completely independent. And these scientists have no link to the cholesterol hypothesis, so they can write and publish what they like. And it's very important, as I will show you. If you've dedicated your life to believing that cholesterol causes heart disease, it's very difficult for you to come along and say, well, actually it doesn't, and here are the findings that prove it, disprove it. And I'm going to give you one specific example of that. So here's a study from Norway. Norway is one of the healthiest populations in the world. They have low heart disease mortality rates, but they have high cholesterol levels, and it's estimated that something like 80% of Norwegians should be on cholesterol-lowering drugs if the guidelines are true. This is for the healthiest, one of the healthiest populations in the world. doesn't make sense. Anyway, this is a very, very, very complex slide, and I'm going to take you through it very, very slowly. On the left, we have women, either non-smokers or smokers. On the right, we have men, either non-smokers or smokers. And these are the risk factors that doctors like to measure in you. They like to measure your age, they like to measure your systolic blood pressure, and they like to measure your cholesterol levels and smoking. So we've got the interaction of four risk factors. Sorry, is it? Yeah, it's four. Age, cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, and smoker, non-smoker. So now they've categorized these non-smoking women as either with a low cholesterol, 5.5, or high cholesterol above 5.5, the smokers below five, above five, and then the men the same. And so what? You, and then they've. This is your risk. Your five. Your ten-year risk of a fatal heart attack per hundred thousand. So this, if it's orange, would mean that five percent of these people are at risk of having a heart attack in the next ten years. Whereas if it's blue, the risk is less than one percent. 
So we're not going to worry too much about age 40 because it's all blue, everyone's doing fine. And we're not going to worry too much about 40 to 59 because, again, most are blue except here. Oh, well, let's look here. So what this tells us is that by the age of 50, 40 to 59, if you are a smoker and have high blood pressure there, your risk of having a heart attack is now becoming increased. You've now got a 3% risk. But the key is, what does cholesterol add to your risk? And the answer is it adds no risk at all because the difference is between 3 and 3.3. So we could predict your risk here just by knowing your age, your blood pressure, and, and, and whether or not you're a smoker. Being a, being, your cholesterol doesn't help us at all. It doesn't seem to add to risk. And let's then go to the older age group between 60 and 74. The same applies. There's no difference in risk between people who have low cholesterol or high cholesterol. There's no difference in risk in that population in that group. There's no difference in risk here and in this group actually the people who have a high cholesterol are at slightly lower risk but that's going to be an artifact. So the only group on this where the risk is slightly higher in the people with a higher cholesterol is this perhaps it's this group here. That's the only group. That's women smoking with a cholesterol of 5.5 and that's you're going to find those variants. So the conclusion from this study is that cholesterol above 5.5 doesn't add any to predictive risk. So we found total cholesterol to be an overestimated risk factor. Our results contradict the guidelines well-established demarcation line of 5 millimoles per litre between a good and two high good levels of cholesterol. They also contradict the popularized idea of a positive linear relationship between cholesterol and fatal heart disease, which is what we taught, which was what Goldstein and Brown said, the more cholesterol, the more heart attack doesn't show it. So that's an independent study showing that. And then I was fortunate to get these data from the old mutual. Now these are data for millions and millions of South Africans whose lives are insured. And I can tell you old mutual better know whether they are properly just, uh, adjusting the risk for their patients, for the people who are insured with them. And what they show is that these are the five groups of different ages, 25, 35, 45, 55, 56. And these are the cholesterol levels. That's below 5. That's 5 to 7.5, and that's above 7.5. And you can see that with one exception, and that's only in this group here, having a cholesterol above 7.5 is of no predictive value whatsoever. And these are South Africans predicted. And in fact, as you get older, which is exactly in compa is compatible with the world literature, that having a cholesterol above 7.5 actually helps you if you're above 56. Now, I, I can tell you because I know that they are realizing that it's predictors of insulin risk that are the best predictors of what your risk of heart attack is. And there's one single, the two predictors that, that this company or others can use. And the first is your waist circumference and the other is whether or not you have fatty liver disease. And I'm going to come to that. Because fatty liver disease is the key driver of the abnormal lipoproteins that cause heart disease. And we'll come to that again. So then let's just look now. Um, I'm not a cardiologist. I don't necessarily read the cardiology journals. But when I present these data to cardiologists, it's like they don't exist. But this is from their own journals. And this then is the predictive value, the hazard ratios for associational studies between cholesterol and long-term heart attack risk. And so let's look at the factors. And what's the number one factor, diabetes? And look at the hazard ratio. Remember the hazard ratio we said would become predictive? It's a value of two. Sorry, this paper is lipid-related markers and cardiovascular disease prediction, the emerging risk factor collaboration. So this is a large study of 165,000 subjects who, of which 15,000 developed heart attacks and 5,000 had strokes. And this is the hazard ratios that they show. And remember, this is, this is the emerging risk factor collaboration. It's a major study. This is what people would use uh, if they wanted to prove the relationships. And what is the first factor? It's diabetes. And that, remember we said the hazard ratio above 2 is predictive of importance. And remember what I said to you, diabetes 
is a generalized arterial disease. And heart disease is one form of generalized arterial disease. And diabetes is the best predictor. Then age, then smoking, then blood pressure. Where does cholesterol fit in? 1.2. Now, as a hazard ratio, that is meaningless. That does not prove causation. It is very poor. And triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. So those factors are, are really poor predictors. And yet the whole basis of the hypothesis is that cholesterol must be the most powerful predictor of heart attack risk. And it isn't. And therefore, if it's such a poor predictor, can we expect it to be causative? So one way we could look at that would be to say, well, has there ever been a study of people who've had heart attacks or died and someone measured the extent of arterial disease and related to their cholesterol level in the blood? That's the question, because the hypothesis, the theory, cannot exist until that is proven. So if we go back to the literature, here's a paper by Landy and Sperry, and it's published in 1936, in which they did autopsies on people who obviously had died, that had not, that had traumatic deaths, as I recall, and they knew the cholesterol level, which is on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the amount of fat that is present in the aorta, which is the large blood vessel, and would be a measure of how much arterial disease there is. What this shows is that there was no relationship between the cholesterol in the blood and the amount of fat in the, in the blood vessels. And this has been extended, and there are two abstracts which we, I present again, and I apologize if we haven't discovered them, and we'd be happy to do that, but the point is they make the same point. And here's the conclusion. The large number of null results for the association between serum LDL cholesterol levels and the prevalence or progression of both calcified and non-calcified plaque in the appropriate vascular beds and involving large numbers of men and women over a wide range of age, ethnic background, plaque burden and cholesterol levels cannot be easily dismissed. There is a lot of evidence that there is no relationship between blood cholesterol and the extent of arterial disease.